He's the hype man. Directly into the crowd. Yeah, with the big bubble, you know. <laughs> This conference, it has an unerring knack for exploring the great issues of our time. The organizers of this weekend have pulled together, I think, a really stellar roster to help us, all of us, acquire a state of the art understanding, to understand our communities, to understand our country, and to understand our world. Township meetings bring liberty within people's reach. They teach people how to enjoy liberty and how to use it. And so it gives me great privilege to be part of this exercise in civil liberties. What you have here is very unique. And I do think that you should take the Camden Conference on a roadshow because this conference has a very unique DNA. The biggest problem is this. A lie told a million times becomes a fact. Without the facts, you can't have truth. Without truth, you can't have trust. If you have no facts, no truth, no trust, you have no democracy. This is what we need to fight for. I was wondering what advice you all have for those who want to change the world, both in their careers and their social lives. We have the opportunity to invent new models, to do things differently. It's a provocative conference. It makes you think, it keeps you alert, keeps you alive in terms of being a citizen of the world. It's giving me this insight that you don't get just from reading the newspaper. To meet people from different parts of the world or with different perspectives is just such an eye-opening experience. What I find here is uh, stimulating, intriguing. Informative. Energizing. Brain-bending. Enlightened. Just great. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Ross Hickey. I'm an assistant provost here at the University of Southern Maine. We are thrilled to be hosting this panel tonight. This is a very exciting topic. And you may say, why am I so excited and thrilled about being part of this tonight? Well, I'm going to give you a direct answer, and then I'm going to give you a broader answer in a few minutes. So here's the, the direct answer to this, why we are thrilled to be here and hosting this panel, which is since its initial proposal, USM has been deeply invested in the development of a new coal storage facility and its impact for Maine. And in 2017, with support from the Maine Economic Improvement Fund, our MBA students, supervised by Professor Bob Heiser, had developed a market impact and analysis study. And that study found that the coal storage facility could provide Maine with a potential long-term economic windfall of between $500 million to $900 million. The report findings were presented publicly and in multiple forums and were integral to the planning and approval process. So that's a direct reason for why we are excited to be here hosting this tonight. Now let me talk briefly about broad, more broadly why uh, the University of Southern Maine, we're excited to have this discussion today. 
which is we see that the promi that the that coal storage offers a promise of expanded economic ties to the North Atlantic. And expanded economic ties lead to other things. They cascade into stronger connections culturally, environmentally, academically. And we have seen this already begin to happen. It's not just a future event. And I'll give you some a few examples. So nations such as Iceland have a strong tradition of sustainability and utilizing their marine resources responsibly. And may, we in Maine could stand to benefit from, from learning about those technologies and the, those processes and their use of full utilization of their resources. And there's an example right here in Portland, Maine that you may be familiar with, the New England Ocean Cluster, which incorporates a lot of these approaches to Maine's blue economy. And USM's faculty and students have been our active uh, partners in that work. Give you a couple of recent examples. Our composite engineering research lab has recently been assisting Viable Gear, which is a new main company seeking to reduce petroleum-based plastics in, the, in our oceans by producing fishing and marine farming gear using polymers derived from renewable resources. And our CERL lab is also helping in the design and testing for Opulus Optics, which uses recycled plastic that typically turns up in the ocean as an upcycled material for durable goods, such as sustainable sunglasses. Another example, the third annual International Graduate Student Research Cohort, that's a mouthful, right? Brings together students and faculty from all over the North Atlantic and in universities in Maine as well. And we recently had our third annual event where our students with their colleagues at other universities Collaborated on, research, collaborated on research that resulted in publishable papers and a joint presentation at the Arctic Circle Assembly in Reykjavik, Iceland, where several of our panelists were there as well. That was earlier in October. So this, is an, this 2022 cohort uh, focused their research on innovative best practices and partnerships in the blue economy as three, seen through the lens of the triple bottom line, that is people, planet, and profit. And so our students had the opportunity to work with colleagues all over the North Atlantic, publish their findings, and also get to present at an international conference. Final example of the broader impacts of greater economic ties in the North Atlantic that uh, the coal storage facility offers potentially is the North Atlantic Triennial, which just recently uh, was uh, down at the Portland Museum of Art. And that was co-sponsored by the Reykjavik Art Museum in Iceland and the Bildsmuseet in Sweden. And the North Atlantic Triennial was the first exhibition devoted entirely to contemporary art from the North Atlantic region. And it featured maps from our OSHA map library and artwork from USM alum, Justin Levesque. So indeed, we are excited, not only for what is already occurring, but also the future possibilities as the coal storage facility is built to lead to greater ties economically, environmentally, artistically. So thank you all for enlightening us tonight with some more information. I'm going to turn it over to Betsy. Good evening. I'm Betsy Mayberry. I'm the coordinator of the Southern Maine Initiative of the Cabinet Conference and on the board. And I want to welcome you from the conference and thank you, Ross, for your presentation on USM's involvement. I want to extend a welcome to all of you this evening, one from the Cabinet Conference and one from everybody here to the people who apparently are watching through Zoom because we had 100 people sign up for this event. Um, this event, Maine's Exporting Future, heats up with cold storage, along with other community events in our local libraries are related to the Camden Conference theme. Global Trade and Politics, Managing Turbulence. We are happy to see you here tonight, both the Zoom folks and the live folks, and hope to see you 
at the three-day conference in February from the 17th to the 19th. This conference will be live at the Camden Opera House, live streamed to Belfast, Rockland, and to Hatterford Hall here in Portland. For more information about our wonderful roster of speakers at the February conference, go to our website, camdenconference.org. Before I introduce our moderator, Carol Coltus, I want to thank V. Sheehan, a Camden Conference volunteer and co-chair of the Southern Maine Committee, who worked so hard to get this event to happen. V, can you stand? Carol Coltus, our moderator of tonight's panel, will introduce our other presenters. Carol is the business projects editor of the Portland Press Herald, Maine Sunday Telegram, and formerly the business editor of the Portland Press Herald and the editor of Maine Biz. This is Carol's third year as moderator at a Camden Conference special event. It's actually Wade's third year as panelist also. So people do come back. So that's a good thing. Um, we want to thank them both for their participation. And we want to thank them for the things that helped make these events so special to us. I turn it over to Carol. Thank you, Betsy. Welcome, everyone. It is uh, really wonderful to be at a live event. This is the first time I've moderated a live event in, I think, three years. So it's great to see human beings. I can read faces. I can scan the room as opposed to doing it on Zoom and hoping people don't get out of line on the chat. Um, but hello to all the folks who have, uh, who have logged in from Zoom. We appreciate your attendance here too. And we think that we've got this hybrid thing worked out. So uh, we'll find out in, in a little bit. <clears throat> Excuse me. I am just recovering from a cold, laryngitis and conjunctivitis. So I'm gonna not speak any louder than this and I'm not gonna, I'm, I'll put my mask right back on when I, when I sit down again. Um, but I hope that I'm clear enough and you can, can you hear me in the back? Okay, good, thank you, okay. So I think this is a really interesting time to talk about trade. Um, I, I'm, if you think about it, we have a, a presidential administration that's been in office less than two years, and it changed the trade policies of the previous administration, which changed the trade policies of the administration before that. And for anyone who's a manufacturer or a producer, and trying to deal with the world of imports and exports, you must feel like you're just watching the bouncing ball. And so, um, so I think that we hopefully are on the other side of a, of a pandemic. Some of those horrible uh, supply chain issues that have complicated doing business, not just on a global, a national or a regional, but here in the state of Maine, that some of those are now um, in the process of being resolved. So what better time to introduce this new cold storage facility um, because of the opportunities that it will present for anyone who's involved in any kind of trade um, uh, opportunities. So, <clears throat> excuse me, as I'm sure most of you know, this has been a long delayed project, but it should have exponential impact on Maine's import export business once it's finished in 2024. More than 10 years ago, when I was at Maine Biz, I had a reporter write a story about the potential for Maine's port facilities. Um, this was pre Aimskip, the Icelandic shipping company that made Portland its US headquarters in 2013. And at the time, it was clear from the reporting, um, the reporter had talked to several port managers all along the Eastern seaboard that if Maine wanted to play in the big leagues, it needed to have significant cold storage capabilities, and it didn't. So <clears throat> now here we are, um, the $55 million project broke ground in August, 
And over that same 10 year period, I just was referencing, Aimskip has invested about $100 million to revive facilities at the International Marine Terminal. And the state has invested more than 70 for things like cranes and enhanced rail links. So combined, these investments put Maine in a position to expand export opportunities for Maine agriculture, aquaculture, beverage producers, and others. And as Ross just mentioned, that report, 500 to $900 million in new possible um, economic drivers here for the state of Maine. So to learn more about this, the Camden Conference has organized a terrific panel. I'm going to briefly introduce them and they are going to make individual presentations. After all three have presented, we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Um, I'd ask for the Zoom folks to please submit any questions you might have using the Q&A button on the bottom of your navigation bar. And our fabulous Zoom guru, Strawberry Mojni, who's out back in the control room there, she'll queue up the questions from our Zoom attendees. Um, you folks here in Hannaford Hall are certainly welcome to ask questions when we get to that portion of the evening. And a few of you submitted questions when you registered for, the, for this event, and we have queued those up for our panelists as well. So let's get to it. First up, Wade Merritt, a mainstay, as we just learned, for the Camden Conference. I can't imagine anything dealing with trade in Maine and not having Wade as a central figure. Um, but M M Wade is the president of the Maine International Trade Center, a position he's held since 2017. In this role, he's responsible for directing the trade and investment policy for the state, including the delivery of international trade services to Maine's business and academic communities. His many decades of service with MITSI has brought him to 15 different markets on four continents. A native of Bangor and a graduate of the University of Maine, Wade recently completed a program on nonprofit leadership at Stanford University. At the other end of the table, we have professional mariner Matthew Burns, who is the executive director of the Maine Port Authority. He was formally appointed to his post in May following a year as interim director. Matt is responsible for overseeing the state's three saltwater ports in Portland, Searsport, and Eastport. He is a Maine Maritime graduate who spent 13 years as a deck officer on large ships of all types across the world. He joined the Maine Department of Transportation, which is the agency that oversees the Maine Port Authority um, in 2017 as Director of Ports and Marine Transportation. And finally, we have Peter Ron joining us tonight. Pete is the Director of Quality and Food Innovation at Atlantic Sea Farms, a position he's held since 2019. You may know that company better by its former name, Ocean Approved. That's how I first understood that there are these people growing fabulous kelp in, uh, in Casco Bay. So Pete has been the food safety and quality control business. He's been in that business since 2006, uh, before he landed at Atlantic Sea Farms, which is a leading seafood aquaculture company in the US. He's a graduate of the UMaine Food Science and Technology Program, and he's working on his master's degree at UMaine in food service. So welcome, all of you. Thank you for being here tonight. And um, Wade, we're gonna, because you have longevity, we're going to, or seniority, we'll say that. You, you get to get the ball rolling. So please talk to us about what's happening with trade on a kind of a big scale here in Maine, but then bring it down to, and what does the cold storage facility mean? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, right, I, I guess I get to be the old man of international <laughs> trade now, which is sort of amazing. And, and you're right, this is a fascinating time to be thinking about international trade. Um, I took the job in 2017, but I have been with the Trade Center since 1996. Um, as my um, as my dear friend Denise Garland, who's the deputy commissioner of the Department of Economic and Community Development, says that kindergarten job placement program was great. I'm really <laughs> glad that I still have it. Um, but yeah, 26 years, and it's it's changed a lot. I mean, when I first started doing this work, we were talking about fax machines and uh, going out and trying to proselytize the masses about why we should be thinking about international trade. And it's really not the case anymore. Most most businesses have have at least thought about it. Um, if they've not, at least they maybe tried it. 
Um, the proselytizing, although it still occurs, is it's it's not quite the same as it was. Um, but your your comment about um, you know the follow the bouncing ball, I might also say whiplash. Um, I, I I'm in close connection with my uh, predecessor. Uh, who I served as her VP for 11 years. And I tell her, you know, I would have liked your job because mine's been kind of uniquely challenging since 2017. Um, to recap, if you if you have not, because of course we've we've gone just gone through this pandemic where it felt like time was in a bit of a, a time warp. Um, we've had trade wars. We've had a change of administration with changing trade policies. Oh yes, a pandemic. Um, a shift very much to hybrid events. The last time I sat up here was in 2018 and this room was full. Uh, for those of you at home, we're probably about 25 of you sitting in the crowd right now. Um, political unrest here and abroad, such as we have not seen a land war in Europe. Um, I will say that one of the most bizarre parts of my time at the Trade Center was writing a press release about how we were gonna be dealing with trade with a land war going on in Europe. Uh, with Russian aggression. Certainly never thought that I would be writing press releases or media commentary about that. Um, and of course, the supply chain issues that we found ourselves facing um, and have found ourselves facing over the last couple of years, including cold chain, where you know we've been talking about this for 10 years. I think the, the upshot of all of that is that there's never enough cold chain and there's never enough supply chain. Um, so the, the issues have shifted dramatically in the last five years. And those are just a few of the ones that we're that we're kind of dealing with. Um, on the cold storage in, in, in specifically too, I think this is also really interesting. Ross mentioned it in his opening remarks, talking about the international connection with Aimskip really driving um, some innovation. Normally, when you think about a shipping line coming to town, you're talking about the business relationship. And I am an economic development and international trade development person. So that's where I will spend the bulk of my time talking tonight. But this, this relationship with the North Atlantic really obviously caught the imagination of many people across the state, particularly here in Portland, with museums and universities participating in, in, in that relationship. But it also created some really interesting economic opportunities, such as the development of a cold storage facility, which may not, in fact, it didn't um, occur, even though this probably made sense for the state for a while. Um, really didn't occur until there was a significant amount of throughput of this type of, of uh, refrigerated freight through the Port of Portland. And the reason why we're having this cold storage facility being built there is because of Ameskip's investment um, at the port. And then, of course, the Port Authority's on top of uh, the Port Authority's investment on top of that as well. These investments, though, you know, it's sort of the perception out there that they're being built because Ameskip is here really benefits the entire state and the entire region. Um, we talk a little bit, I'm, I'll mention this a little bit further on in the presentation, but talking about um, trade in food and refrigerated goods, I'm going to talk about it. You would expect to be hearing me, to me banging the table about international trade opportunities. Yes, they are there, but it is also um, really looking at this as a gateway for um, for trade flows to be coming into the U.S. through our port, which is, again, going to benefit us in, in other ways, such as infrastructure investments and, and other things. Um, so like the IMT itself, um, investments because of the trade flows are, are, are going to benefit um, businesses and state, whether or not you're involved necessarily in international or not. Um, I'm going to spend just a couple minutes here talking about the Trade Center um, and what we do and uh, some kind of high-level trade commentary. Um, because this is such an enormous topic, I've sort of left it for questions because we could go off on about 100 different directions, and I, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Um, <clears throat> as we mentioned, the Maine International Trade Center, which is the organization that I lead, we're a public-private partnership of the state government, um, economic and community development, as well as the business community. We have about 300 members that pay dues, but because of our um, state appropriation, companies do not need to be members of the organization to access services. I see a few members of the Trade Center out in the audience tonight and a couple of board members. It's nice to have you here with us. Thank you for that. Um, the Trade Center really is in business to work with Maine's businesses, communities, um, to engage them in international opportunities. This can be exports, this can be investment attraction, um, this can be student attraction, 
Um, if it has international on it, most likely it's passing over our desks at some point in the process. Uh, we support our business community in a number of different ways. You'll notice I'm going to say business community a lot. Um, we very much try to not be yet another state agency. We're very much um, come at this with a small business mindset um, so that we're able to understand the needs of the small business community that we serve. Um, we support the business community in a number of ways, including putting together organized trade events. Um, if you know, we haven't done one in a while, but if you happen to have seen um, news coverage about the governor taking a trade mission, that's our organization that puts those together. Uh, we also bring um, groups of companies to trade mission to trade shows overseas to to, uh, to introduce them to potential buyers. Um, we do educational seminars as well as um, some key services, which include one-on-one -on -one business assistance, actually sitting down with a company and talking through their needs and trying to help um, help solve them, um, as well as financially supporting them through a federal program that we administer. Our business support program is really the kind of key, the core of the work that the Trade Center does. Um, it's actually sitting down and um, working through business issues and finding solutions. This is either through the knowledge that our team has. Many times it's through the network of people that we know um, all around the world at this point. This is the beauty of leading a, a mature 26 year old organization is that if you need to get someplace, we likely can get it, you there in a, in a phone call or two um, from, the, from the folks that we know. Um, as well as uh, as research, if it's a question that we that really don't know, we had one of those pop up today. Um, anybody know about exporting periwinkles to the European Union? I can answer that question for you afterwards. Um, so the research that we provide as well, uh, we have a team of four trade specialists um, and some supporting staff as well that are that are able to provide answers. Um, we try to turn them turn questions around in three or four days at the at a minimum, um, so that that quest that. Uh, because oftentimes the questions that we're being asked um, need quick answers, and we're we're pleased to be able to uh, pleased to be able to provide them. In addition to supporting the business community with knowledge, we also administer a federal program that provides financial support. So if you're listening to me from home or from the audience, um, we're able to help support businesses um, with some financially uh, with. Um, some federal funds that we administer again uh, with through four different categories. One is actually. Um, bringing the horses to water through the International Business Development Program. If you're attending a trade show, we can help offset costs there. If there's some kind of training that you need to be able to give to your employees, we can help support that. Um, and then the new one is the one here at the bottom of the slide talking about e-commerce and digital marketing. This was an enormous shift um, that happened during the, uh, during the pandemic as trade shows sort of disappeared there for about a year and a half to two years. And many of our clients um, started shifting to an online sales strategy um, and redeveloping websites, developing, having to have things translated, uh, being able to, to accept euro instead of dollars. Um, these all have costs. And um, through this program, we're able to help offset some of those and help keep our business community competitive. So why is this all important? Um, why have I been doing this for 26 years? It, it may be that I'm otherwise unemployable. It's also that, um, <laughs> I don't know, I hope not. Uh, it also is because it's just enormously fascinating. That's where the, that was the word I started with, right? It's enormously fascinating. There are over 2000 companies in the state that are exporting somewhere. Um, three and a half, almost three, a little over three, about three and a half probably this year, by the time we end the year, billion dollars worth of goods and services that are going to 177 markets um, around the world. I'll tell you about where they are in a second here. About 100 million of that goes to the North Atlantic. Uh, more of that passes through our ports in both, through our port, ports, Matt will tell you, um, in both directions. 85% um, of our exporters are actually small and medium sized, by which I mean we've got under, mean we have under 500 employees. The perception is that international trade is a big company game. Um, it's, it is, but it's also a very, it's a small company game in Maine because that's what we have, right? The 85% the of them are small businesses. So it is really not just the large ones. Last year, we served over 325 um, companies and it, uh, I, I think, representing 30 different industry sectors in Maine. Uh, so it is very, very dispersed um, throughout, this, throughout the state and throughout the state's business community. And international trade supports more than one in five main jobs, about 150,000. 
Our top exports should probably be no surprise. These are the kind of traditional strengths of the main economy. Seafood, of course, the lobster industry continues to be the leading um, exported commodity for main uh, aircraft and spacecraft parts. Uh, we have a very large presence, Pratt Whitney down in Berwick, um, and also CNL Aerospace up in Bangor. Um, paper and paperboard, wood and wood pulp, of course, the forest products industry remains a strong exporting um, import, exporting industry. Electronic and industrial machinery, most of that is the semiconductor plants in South Portland, but there are some others. Um, and of course, medical and surgical instruments. Food and agriculture is a bit further down the list, but they are in the, still in the top 10 um, and also enjoy domestic markets that are gonna be helped very much by the arrival of this cold storage facility. Because as I mentioned, it's important to remember that yes, although international is part of the story, the domestic market, uh, as far as cold storage is concerned, is, is an important component to it. Um, our top export markets, again, probably no big surprise, Canada, it's in giant capital bold letters up here behind me because that is about 50% of what we export in any given year. Um, in fact, if you took New Brunswick and Quebec and broke them out separately, they would be second and third. Um, it is, uh, it, it's kind of, is Canada and everybody else. Um, and then you see down the list here, most of the major markets, Western Europe and Northeastern um, Asia, Obviously, Canada, the Netherlands, Singapore, and the UK, um, all markets that will be served or could be served by a cold storage facility down at the IMT. Um, and then finally, as I wrap up here, we'll talk about just a bit about the cold storage opportunity, which Matt will know far more about um, than I am. But we're looking at this very much um, as, as a major missing piece of infrastructure that's we have not had really in Maine for a long time. There is one, there is a cold storage facility in Portland. It was built in 1955. The uh, lobster industry doesn't trust it and is basically trucking everything to Massachusetts and back um, to make sure that the obviously very high value products that they that they store in there are able to be to be safe. So this is something that is um, uh, an important piece of infrastructure that we've had our eye on for quite some time. Um, we're working and promoting this um, in state to our clients in these industries, but also overseas as well. To talk with food and beverage, agriculture, seafood companies, um, maybe life sciences too. The requirements are a little bit different for life sciences than they are for food, but it's, uh, it's obviously an industry that requires cold chain. Um, we're looking at all the opportunities inbound, outbound, exports, domestic. Um, there's opportunities in every possible direction in and out of that facility, I think, that that you can you can possibly think about. Um, the, the other kind of point I wanted to talk one last little bit here, the other opportunity is actually being able to think about perhaps capturing some freight that's going to ports around us um, that are obviously having some congestion issues that we may we do not have here. Um, I had a look at it this morning. There's about $2 billion of frozen food that's being traded through ports in New England that are not in Maine. Um, a lot of that obviously is Boston, but there, is, uh, there are other smaller ports around New England that are, that are handling some of this stuff. $2 billion of frozen food that's traded every year with Europe um, using a New England port outside of Maine and having this facility down on the waterfront could help us capture a piece of that. Um, and as I started, and as I will end, these um, these investments in infrastructure absolutely can have benefits to the state in bringing more infrastructure that can benefit the companies that are here. And trade is what's helping me do it. So thank you for that. I know that there will be questions. Uh, so I'm going <laughs> to leave it there, but thank you very much. So Wade, I'm, I'm just, um, yeah. I'm curious, have you been fielding questions from some of the seafood companies in terms of the timeline for when the cold storage facility will be ready and how are they, I mean, I know you can't reveal any identifiable confidential information, but how are you seeing people's interest manifesting? Are they thinking this will allow us to do new markets or like what's, what are you hearing on the ground? Yeah, and I will, you know, I'll obviously also also defer to Matt on what he he's hearing about because we're our teams are working really closely on this. But I will say that um, you know most of the conversation that we're hearing from the industry is that they're they're pretty excited that they're going to be able to reduce the costs by not having to transit their freight back and forth to Massachusetts. I mean, a lot of that. I mean, you think about just the the impact of even if it was just down and back four hours in your car in the on the truck, just down and back to Massachusetts. Um, 
And just to avoid 93. Just to avoid the traffic, right? I mean, and of course, you've got carbon footprint issues and you've got emissions issues. You've got mm -hmm. you're being able to take trucks off the road um, on the turnpike. I mean, there's a lots of lots of good reasons to do it. Um, obviously, the business community is looking at this from a cost perspective. It doesn't doesn't cost as much. You don't you're not incurring the the, uh, the, the charges to move things down and back, sometimes multiple times um, down, back, down, you know, down, stored, back, process, down, stored, back. Uh, it, it's it uh, it will make a big difference, and that's what we're hearing from the industry. I think it's a um, we're we're looking forward to it. When's it going to happen? Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. And um, I, I don't know. Have you had a chance to do any analysis of the two billion dollars of seafood that's being exported from ports not in Maine? Have do you know what having the cold storage facility will do in terms of our ability to to capture some of that? Well, I think you know puts it, first of all it puts us in the game. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and what we what we ended up doing. So the short answer is no, I don't know who's coming through here yet. We're going to have to dig into that a little bit more. And it's not all seafood. Um, I was joking with Matt this this afternoon when I was talking to him, talking him through those numbers. I think number two was meat of swine. I love that meat of swine. Oh, yes. Yes. I remember right. looking at meat of swine. Chess code yes. For right. For meat of swine. Um, anyway, but there's there's lots of other products that go in there as well. And I think having this um, the numbers that I quoted there were imports and exports of frozen food products from the EU. So um, having a state-of-the-art brand new cold storage facility is going to put us in the game to be able to compete for that. I think it's going to be able to help Aimskip compete for that business. Um, and then obviously uh, being able to fulfill orders out of out of, um, out of of our port will, will certainly benefit us. Cool. Yeah. Great. Well, yeah. I think you set the stage nicely yeah. for Matt. I hope so. so. Matt. Tell us some more. Tell me why I'm wrong <laughs> or not. Excuse me. No, wait, I think you uh, you you characterize that very well. So uh, I think our, our presentations will be very complimentary. But uh, yeah, uh, uh, good good evening, everybody. My name's uh, Matthew Burns. I'm the executive director of the Maine Port Authority. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit tonight uh, just, you know, about really what we have done and the, the the journey that we've taken to get to where we are today at the International Marine Terminal, a little bit about what we do as the main port authority. Um, obviously gonna talk about the cold storage. I know that's a, that's a topic that everybody is interested in. So um, without further ado, we'll uh, we'll first cut into to what does the main port authority do? Um, I've got our, our mission statement up uh, behind me, but I'll, I'll break it down so it's 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 very simple. I mean, essentially, we do we do planning, uh, we do uh, business and project development, uh, we do promotion of Maine's ports. So we are uh, probably the number one advocates in the state of Maine for shipping freight by by sea. Uh, and of course, I'm I'm uh, accustomed to that uh, just because of my my background uh, for for several years as a as a as a merchant mariner. So. I love to see our ports being utilized and um, you know new new projects coming in and, and new commodities brought through our ports. So we're huge advocates of that. We also do uh, management and uh, and operations of uh, of marine facilities. So for instance, the IMT in Portland is a facility that the Maine Port Authority owns and operates. Um, so you know that's something that uh, for a, for a rather lean organization can be a little tricky at times. But uh, we've been doing that you know for over ten years and it's been it's been uh, it's been going well, and um, so we're we're going to keep doing. That. Um, we are an independent uh, quasi-governmental agency, but we are very closely connected to uh, the state of Maine government. Obviously, we work very closely with the Maine Department of Transportation. Uh, we do a tremendous amount of uh, you know uh, project planning, and um, you know receive most of our capital uh, funding from the department, uh, so that, that we can you know build projects and uh, you know get the right infrastructure at the terminal to make sure that we have what we need uh, and be able to, uh, you know, keep the business growing. Um, so next, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our three ports that we have in the state. Um, so uh, obviously, we have uh, three deep water ports. We've had a three port strategy uh, since the late 1970s that has really helped the state focus investment on those three deep water uh, port facilities that, that we have here in the state. Um, 
don't ask me, you know, why, or, or I'm not going to, you know, get too far into the history about why they became ports. That's a, that's a whole different topic that we could probably talk for hours on, but, but essentially since the seventies, the state has tried to focus investment there for several reasons. One, it's a lot cheaper to invest in infrastructure and existing port facilities than to build new port facilities. And also it helps keep the <clears throat> industrial deep water seaports from encroaching on some of the smaller uh, fishing communities up and down the main coastline and preserve that that heritage of uh, you know the fishing industry that's very important to the state of Maine. Um, so also uh, I'll just kind of mention uh, you know the port of Rockland uh, and the port of uh, Bar Harbor are also two deep water ports. We really don't see uh, much marine uh, cargo that comes through there, but they are passenger ship ports, and uh, they they do have deep water anchorages for those larger cruise ships to bring passengers in and out of town. Um, so just kind of breaking down a little bit about what each one of the ports, uh, you know, kind of specializes in, I would say uh, all three of the ports in the state are very versatile um, and, and can certainly uh, provide an array of services to different carriers that, um, you know, would like to call and um, call on the port facilities and, and move freight there. Um, so I'll kind of focus in a little bit about the, uh, the International Marine Terminal. Um, I like to characterize the the path that we've taken or how we've got there uh, really in three phases. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, phase one <clears throat> is uh, really the the first major phase of investment. Um, that was really when the state, <clears throat> excuse me, the state had leased the uh, facility from the city of Portland uh, and was starting to plan a container uh, shipping operation there. So really from the time period of about 2011 to 2016, about 20 million total uh, dollars of state uh, of state and federal dollars were invested in the facility. So that was setting the facility up for cargo operations, um, removing old buildings, uh, making improvements to the pier and, and rail connection, uh, building a new warehouse on the site uh, for less than truckload operations and uh, cross dock operations. Uh, as well as utility relocation, which was very important uh, because of some of the existing utilities on the site. Those had to be relocated and adjusted so that we, we could accommodate the, uh, the operation there. The, uh, the second phase of investment, <coughs> excuse me, need a quick drink of water. Um, the next phase of investment, um, phase two, uh, went from about 2016 to 2020. Um, it included a, 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 a wide variety of improvements and probably our largest phase of growth that we, uh, that we saw at the International Marine Terminal. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, we purchased new port equipment. We purchased a new mobile harbor crane, which replaced or uh, was added in addition to the original 100 ton crane that had been there since uh, really since the state took ownership of the uh, or leased the facility. We built new offices, we made improvements to the yard, um, and that's when funding was committed <coughs> for the uh, cold storage facility. I've been completely fine this entire time sitting here, and now I've got a, a frog in my throat, of course, so <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, so really in that, in that second phase of uh, investment there, um, that's when things really took off at the facility, and it really started looking like a, a real container terminal that we, that we have here in the state of Maine. Uh, about $55 million of investment in that phase. The uh, third phase of investment, which is kind of what we're at the tail end of and, and what we're hoping to do in the next couple of years, um, <coughs> involved the purchase of a new crane in 2021, which was delivered by a U.S. flag heavy lift, heavy lift vessel to the port. Um, really a pretty exciting project. Um, and now we had, or at the time, we had three mobile harbor cranes located at the terminal, We've since relocated one of those cranes to the port of Eastport and now have two brand new 124 ton uh, mobile harbor cranes there for cargo operations. <coughs> we purchased new port equipment. Uh, we're also planning, <coughs> excuse me, we're planning a uh, pretty significant uh, expansion to our refrigerated container area. So currently right now we have about 150 uh, uh, plugs that we can use to actually plug the containers in and power the refrigeration units on the containers. We're actually looking to expand that to about 400 plugs. Wow. It's very important uh, to AIM Skip's core business. They move about 35% of their um, 
<laughs> about 35% of their uh, uh, containers on, on, a, on a vessel are uh, refrigerated. So it's very important that they have space to be able to lay those containers down and then have them available for when customers are ready to pick them up or whether they're ready to go back out on truck or broken down in the warehouse and shipped out in individual truckloads. So it's very important to us to have that capacity to be able to keep refrigerated containers on site. Very important to Aimskip's business. We're also planning uh, or you know, developing a, an internal haul road that goes between the International Marine Terminal and the Merrill's Marine Terminal. Uh, this is, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a project that's been planned for several years to help get trucks off the road and really create some synergy between both of those terminals. The idea being that Aimskip has now moved some of their warehousing operations from a facility that is quite a ways outside of town to now relocating it to our sister terminal right down the waterfront, which is really pretty incredible because there's gonna be uh, a, a lot of synergy and free communication of truck routes between both of those facilities and create a lot of efficiency there. Um, the other thing that uh, is going to be happening in this phase is the construction of the cold storage facility, which uh, I'll get into here shortly. <laughs> so how does it all work? Um, you know, why has this been successful and, and why have we been able to grow this shipping line and this service and really create this reliable uh, ocean shipping service for main businesses? Well, one thing that uh, was was thought of, I guess, earlier on was the idea of cost-based geography. And this is kind of an interesting slide that you can take a look at because uh, really those rings represent an equal cost of shipping an ocean container either by truck or by sea. So you can essentially get to Iceland for the same, you can get a shipping container over to Iceland for almost the same cost that it takes to ship a container down to the port of New Jersey. And it just continues on uh, outward in those concentric circles. But you can get an idea of, uh, of, of really what, I guess, came to mind during the, uh, the early stages of this. And that's that opening main businesses up to new markets by ocean shipping is not only something that we have the capability to do, but something that we have the capability to grow and make a very reliable service that these main businesses can, can use that's comparable to you know, highway transportation or rail transportation. The schedule is just as reliable. The cost is reasonable. It's created something that um, you know, these businesses can really grow into. Um, so that's just uh, something that I, I thought was very interesting to share. And of course, you know, with these, uh, these ideas and, and by continuing with these investments, what we've come to realize is almost a 20% growth in container volumes that's happened year over year, um, with our biggest year actually being 2021, where we grew almost 40% uh, after the, the, the really the, uh, the onset of the pandemic. Now with the announcement of a fourth vessel to the, uh, to the rotation of liner service, we have an extra we have an extra vessel coming on one week of the month, um, and that's expected to grow our volume of containers at the terminal by about 25%. Uh, so really, uh, just uh, by, by adding that extra vessel, we've now increased our volume by a significant amount, and that's all great news. Like, I have absolutely no bad things to say about the fact that we're growing. The only difficulty that we possibly have is being able to keep up with it. So we have to continue planning, we have to continue investment, and we have to make sure we're providing the infrastructure so that Aimskip can continue to grow their business. Um, just a little bit about what we've kind of done this year. Uh, I have some pictures here that you know just show some of the things that we've been doing and, and that are important to us, one of which is uh, community engagement, bringing groups into the terminal, not necessarily that are local to the city or to the state, but even internationally. That was a, a group from the U.S. State Department that had came to visit us uh, over the summer. Um, and then, you know, another thing that's important, a lot of these customers, you know, don't necessarily know a lot about how ocean shipping works. So what do we do sometimes if they're interested? We can bring them on board a ship. We can show them exactly how their cargo is loaded. We can show them where their container goes. We can show them what the engine room looks like, what the bridge looks like, meet the ship's officers. It's It's really a a pretty neat thing that, um, <clears throat> you know, I don't think a lot of businesses get to do, but we kind of have that down home feeling here in, in Maine and we like to be able to, to offer that when we can. Uh, the other picture there, that uh, gigantic red looking barge, one of the 
biggest barges I had had seen in a while actually came to the Portland uh, IMT. We loaded that uh, that older crane that I had mentioned onto the barge and transported it up to the port of Eastport. So we now have a mobile harbor crane in all three of our deep water ports. Um, having those cranes, those specialty pieces of equipment, uh, create a lot of efficiency with the uh, the loading and discharging operation of a vessel. They're not quite comparable to those fixed gantry cranes that you see at the port of New York or New Jersey, but they come pretty close. Our operators uh, can get about 24 to 25 containers per hour either put on or off the vessel with one of those cranes. So it's really pretty impressive. Um, and then, of course, uh, uh, I had to put the shameless plug in of uh, my picture with the governor and the transportation commissioner there. <laughs> That was the uh, the groundbreaking for the cold storage facility that we did uh, earlier this summer. We had a groundbreaking announcement where we wanted to announce the, uh, I guess, signing of the ground lease, the facility, and the actual, uh, you know, fact that the project was moving forward. Um, so we did that, and um, we looked to hold a second uh, event sometime uh, in Q1 of uh, 2023. It's going to be kind of more of a, a marketing event. Uh, really to kind of kick off the development of the facility. So um, stay tuned on that. That's uh, that's going to be a, a big one for the uh, future of the cold storage. So now I'll talk a little bit about the uh, main international cold storage facility. Um, obviously, we have a, a rendering here, so you can you can kind of get an idea of what the building is going to look like. Um, it has changed a little bit since the uh, initial iteration that some of you may have been familiar with back in the Americold days. If you remember then uh, there was a, a 70 height, uh, a 70 foot building height that was being proposed that took a zoning change with the uh, with the town or the city of Portland. Um, what we've actually uh, what we've actually uh, have here is is a is a different project. So a uh, slightly uh, less tall building with actually more pallet space and more square footage than uh, had originally been planned. The uh, developer is Amber Infrastructure. They're a London-based infrastructure development firm. Uh, the uh, Also in partnership with Amber is Treadwell Franklin Infrastructure Capital based out of Yarmouth, Maine. Uh, so they've kind of been the local contingent and um, I guess matchmaker, if you will, who have helped kind of put this deal together and, and been a very close partner with us. Also the Maine Department of Transportation, the Maine Port Authority, and of course, Aimskip as well. Um, the uh, the total uh, building uh, size is going to be about 107,000 square foot with 22,000 pallet positions on about a six and a half acre parcel. Um, the ground lease that we've signed is for 50 years. And um, <clears throat> another interesting feature about this building is that it's actually going to have a rooftop solar array, which is going to account for about 20% of the energy requirements of the facility. Um, so again, just uh, some some neat innovation. It's also uh, worth mentioning too that um, they've actually moved from what was originally intended to be an ammonia-based refrigeration system to a CO2-based refrigeration system. This is actually more desirable for some of the potential customers of the facility, uh, and it provides just a, a bit less risk because you're not using a chemical refrigerant. So um, definitely uh, uh, interesting and, and just kind of worth mentioning uh, on those on those. Uh, on those two points, but um, just have a couple of renderings too. You can kind of get another idea of what the facility looks like from the commercial street view. The uh, squiggly, every every time I, I show this picture, somebody asks, but the squiggly lines on the side, that's art. Um, and if you look closely, <laughs> it actually is a drawing of the Portland waterfront. Um, so kind of, a, kind of an interesting and, and cool thing. But um, just to give you an idea, uh, I believe there's 16 loading bays the facility uh, facility will have access to the IMT rail uh, railhead there, so we will be able to move products in and out uh, via rail as well. Uh, so again, uh, it's going to be a state of the art, um, uh, significant development for us. <clears throat> um, so next, I'll just kind of talk about some quick facts, uh, just to get everybody kind of more informed about you know why we're doing this and and what this actually means. Um, as Wade and, 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 and others have pointed out earlier in the discussion, um, there really are very limited cold storage options in the state of Maine. Wade obviously mentioned the, uh, the AmeriCold facility, uh, but, but really that, that's it. Uh, there's not much else that's available to shippers that are in need of uh, cold chain logistics in the state. Um, so really that, that helped, 
I guess, initiate the business case for the state to pursue this in partnership with Ameskip. Um, the global value of cold storage in 2017, so throughout the world, um, was about 149 billion. That's expected to almost double by 2024. So there's really a tremendous market for cold chain logistics and cold storage uh, throughout the world. And if Maine can get put on the map with its own state-of-the-art facility, then I think that's that's really uh, significant. Um, <clears throat> there's been no cold storage increase in the state of Maine over the last 20 years. Whereas if you look comparatively to Massachusetts, they've increased their cold storage capacity in the same time frame by almost 73%. So really, we have a lot of catching up to do because everybody else has been developing facilities like this outside of the state. And we believe pretty strongly that, um, you know, as Wade pointed out, we can be a regional competitor uh, and provide options to not just the state, but really to a, a region of shippers uh, in, the, in the Northeast. Um, so just kind of continuing on, um, some of the potential users obviously include the food and beverage industry, agriculture, and uh, you know potentially biopharmaceutical industry. Um, there has been you know some discussion about food grade bait that would help support the fishing industry. So there's a, vi a wide variety of potential customers that that could be users of this. Um, there will be an operator for the facility selected uh, likely in Q1 of 2023. So the developer will be issuing a request for proposals to try and find a, an operator that's suitable for the facility. Um, marketing efforts will really kick into high gear once that operator has been selected and they can start you know, really kind of developing their customer base and, and marketing the facility to, to those folks. Um, uh, as, uh, <clears throat> as was mentioned earlier in the presentation too, there's expected to be almost a five to $900 million economic impact from the construction of this facility. So it's uh, it's really believed to be uh, a very significant economic driver potentially for not just the Port of Portland, uh, but for the entire state of Maine. And really, you know, just, I think the COVID pandemic has, has kind of cemented this in, but I also believe that it, it's tremendously important, you know, for, for the people of Maine to be able to have food distribution right here in the state where we're kind of in control of that. Um, you know, the cold storage is gonna help with that. And I think it's going to, uh, you know, be a big driver in, in keeping food production and distribution local. <clears throat> so I guess what's on the, what's on the horizon? Um, you know, obviously, you know, cold storage is moving forward. We've signed the lease. We're gonna start construction. Uh, I mean, there's gonna be piling showing up at the end of the month. Uh, and then, you know, construction really will start in earnest, uh, you know, in early December uh, and then and then carry out throughout the new year. Um, we expect the facility to become operational by Q1 2024. So about February time frame of 2024 is, is when we expect that to be online. Um, so we have a lot of work to do in the meantime to continue planning because we never stop doing that. We never stop thinking about the potential and the growth and the ways that we can improve the terminal and keep all that going. So what we've been talking about is um, something that I'm calling Portland Max. So what's the largest size potential vessel that we could ever hope to have tie up at the International Marine Terminal? Right now, it's about 1,100 20-foot equivalent unit size container vessel. 20-foot um, equivalent unit or TEU is pretty much the standard 20-foot uh, container size. So about 1,100 of those uh, containers on board a vessel of that size. At Portland Max, we believe the potential largest size vessel, which would be limited by the uh, controlling depth of the entrance channel, would be about 3,000 TEU. Um, so almost, uh, I guess, almost triple the largest uh, container vessel that we currently have at the IMT right now. So what do we need to do? to achieve Portland Max? Well, first off, we need to think about where we're gonna get the funding to do that. Uh, but we also need to have a, a, a robust and uh, you know, comprehensive growth plan that outlines not just you know, the need for new cranes, but uh, what are some you know, preparations that we might need to make to the wharf or to the container terminal itself to help make traffic flow and container movement throughout the terminal more efficient. If we have congestion and there's log jams at the gates and choke points, it's not going to help anything, and it's it's actually going to 
uh, probably create costs for uh, you know the carrier and for other shippers. So we want to always make sure that we're optimizing, uh, trying to plan and make sure that uh, traffic is flowing through the terminal and we're getting boxes in and boxes out as efficiently as possible. Um, so yeah, there's a variety of improvements that we're looking to make, including dredging, like I said, new port equipment, new offices. Aimskip's looking to grow their workforce. They're looking to build more of a sales team, bring more uh, individuals that can do import and export documentation. There really is a, a, a tremendous variety of, of individuals that they require to run their day-to-day -day operation. And they're seeing a need for a larger office uh, already. And um, we, we've just really made the first announcement about the, <laughs> the, uh, the additional ship. So things are gonna be growing very quickly. Um, <clears throat> that's just something that, uh, is worth mentioning because it's definitely on our radar about how we're going to grow and improve really over the next five, 10 years or so. Um, um Matt, that's a lot to digest. <laughs> it, it is. Yeah. And, and <laughs> I'm actually, uh, one of the things that I'm looking at doing is actually hiring somebody to help me because right now it's, it's just me. So I'm uh, kind of a one man army, but, wow. um, well, let me let me ask Pete. He's sure. the food and beverage. Well, not well. I don't know. Is Kelp beverage as well? Yeah. Okay. Okay. That, so so let's hear from let's hear from uh, Pete then um, about w what your company is doing and where you see the potential. Yeah. For thank you. Can, storage. can everyone hear me? All right. Um, yeah. I'm I'm Pete from uh, Atlantic Sea Farms. I'm the director of uh, quality there, and I run the operations team. Um, Atlantic Sea Farms uh, is a mission-based aquaculture company working with partner farmers, uh, partner fishermen farmers all along the coast of Maine to grow kelp, uh, to diversify their incomes as the um, fisheries face uh, challenges with climate change and uh, other challenges as well. Um, we provide uh, seed spools to all of our partner farmers and uh, we provide technical support and um, and help them get their leases. And then we guarantee to purchase back all of the kelp that they grow from the farms, from the seaweed that we provide them. Uh, we currently have 30 partner farmers along the coast of Maine from Casco Bay to Eastport that grew 1 million pounds of kelp in the 2022 harvest season. And we're halfway, currently halfway through our current seeding season um, now to grow more this winter. And we're on pace to have a 50% growth in what we did over the last year. So our fourth consecutive year a really strong growth. Uh, we grow and produce fully traceable kelp products, uh, and they're fully traceable from um, from the seed that we provide all the way to the finished product to the stores where we ship them to. Uh, and we have a strong focus on site selection and and clean waters and and where we site our farms and and working with our farmers. Um, and our farms are located in in areas that are. Uh, monitored by the DMR for for clean water and uh, and and ensuring um, a better finished product, and it also supports a lower heavy metal content in in seaweed. Seaweed is a is a plant that that kind of absorbs what's in the environment around it, and and traditionally, uh, seaweed is and kelp has been viewed as a product that has a higher heavy metal content. Uh, so our site selection and our and our processes ensure lower heavy metal content, which allows us to. Um, meet the demand of the U.S. market. Um, there's a lot of uh, consumer consumer interest in in healthy products that are lower in heavy metals, and and we can provide that with our um, with our with our practices. Uh, and and for exporting, we're seeing markets in Asia start to have that same customer demand for nu nutritious seaweed and um, uh, lower heavy metal content and. Japan and Korea consume the most seaweed globally, and China, which hasn't consumed as much as Japan and, and Korea, uh, traditionally, are, are, we're starting to see a, an increase in the demand for seaweed in, in that market as well. Uh, so we're poised to grow the market in the United States and then have a product that's really attractive for uh, international markets um, as we grow. So. As we continue to scale up, um, there's huge potential in three to five years to export our kelp to meet to meet the demand uh, for traceable line grown seaweed um, throughout the globe. Uh, Atlantic Sea Farms represents 80% of all of the seaweed that's cultivated in the United States, but 98% of the seaweed that's eaten in the United States is imported um, is imported from around the world. 
So mm -hmm. huge, huge potential for us to grow within the United States uh, and then um, opportunity to export uh, once we can meet that demand. And so we we'll absolutely need cold storage infrastructure uh, to meet the local demand. And then we'll need that shipping ex shipping infrastructure to, to export, to meet the export demand. Um, there's currently only 20 miles of working waterfront along Maine's 3,500 miles uh, coastline. So that 20 miles provides an incredible economic impact to the, to the coast of Maine and those coastal communities. Atlantic Sea Farms, uh, we create a lot of new products and develop the market, um, everything from blanched shredded kelp uh, to fermented products. People use our seaweed and, and even dog treats and, and uh, energy drinks and things like that. So uh, we developed that, that market to grow and, and to get more farmer fishermen on the water. Um, and we've seen the growth of our landings increase quite a bit over the last uh, three years. We've, we've quadrupled uh, size. Um, so we need that infrastructure to support that continued growth um, and to support the um, working waterfront and the waterfront facilities. So we have a huge, huge need for the local freezing and, and cold storage infrastructure, and we're super excited about the new um, Maine International Cold Storage Facility. Uh, it can't open fast enough for us. <laughs> um, yeah. Our current... Uh, Freezing and cold storage process requires a huge amount of logistics and shipping. Uh, we're one of those companies that has to ship our stuff outside of the state in order to freeze it. Um, we process, our harvest season is from April to June every summer. We process 60% of what we harvest during that time period. And the 40% and the um, that's left over, we, we put into cold storage for processing throughout the rest of the year. Uh, so to look at that 2022 harvest, for an example, um, we harvested a million pounds of kelp. We processed uh, 600,000 pounds of that uh, into finished products, and then 400,000 pounds we sent off-site for cold storage to process from for, throughout the rest of the year. So uh, 400,000 pounds that we sent for freezing, uh, we, we harvest into 1,000-pound bags, which basically takes up a pallet space. So that 400,000 pounds is 400 pallet spaces. Uh, three years ago, we ran out of our capacity at, at uh, local local cold storage facilities. Uh, th last year, we yes, excuse me. Three years ago, we ran out of space at the local facilities and had to uh, ship start shipping our seaweed um, down to Gloucester, Massachusetts. And last year, we ran out of that capacity as well and had to go even further to Sharon, Massachusetts. So and so as we grow, as I mentioned, we're gonna expand another 50% this coming year. We just have to keep sending our kelp further and further away um, to for cold storage. Uh, and then our, a lot of our finished products are frozen as well. So those have to have to be stored and shipped back and forth as we process and ship to our customers. So really excited about having that uh, cold storage facility <laughs> come online. <laughs> Uh, and it's uh, vital for our growth and, and for the growth of our mission. We want to get more partner farmers in the water, diversify more incomes on coastal economies, and uh, continue to, to grow and, and maintain the working waterfront. Matt, are you taking reservations? Yeah, that's, where do yeah, I, I was going to say, Pete, yeah. message received. I'll get on it. You know. So, Pete, I'm I'm fascinated by the, you see markets in Asia. I would assume that Asia does a lot of growing of its own kelp, mm -hmm. but is it because you can guarantee that there's no heavy metal in the kelp that you raise here? Yeah. That's your market advantage. Yeah, ex exactly. So the, those markets in in Asia, um, they they are um, they're on that trend of of looking for a lower heavy metal content in their seaweed. And, and they're not sure if they're able to supply that with, with the kelp that they grow lo locally to them. Wow. So it's a huge advantage for us as we grow to be able to supply that to, the, to the, those markets. Wow, cool. Um, I think we can switch to questions now. And I'm going to take one that came in uh, when, when uh, someone registered for this event. And then someone else also made the same question. Uh, I think these are potential customers, but they're looking for things like some of the details about the capabilities of the cold storage 
uh, facility like? What's the temperature range? And um, is it going to be divided evenly uh, for export and import storage? Or like, are, have any, does any of that information exist yet, Matt? Uh, yeah, temperature range, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident to say that, um, you know, it can go, I believe, as low as minus 35 or minus 40. And then, you know, that's a, a bit different than the individual shipping containers who can get a little bit colder inside the facility itself. But um, yeah, and, and then, you know, like as far as how everything's going to get kind of organized, it's really going to be up to the operator. So okay. once once the operator's selected and they can kind of come in and figure out how they want to run the uh, the facility, then that, that'll that get set up, you know, for optimal efficiency. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, how about a question from the audience here? Yes, this fellow right here. Uh, question, how is the fish exchange going to be impacted by uh, this? Is that a choke point? Is it an uh, opportunity for, for reestablishing the, the marketplace of that? <laughs> I'll take a stab at it. I think I think there's potentially an opportunity there for the fish fish exchange. Um, I think it'll become a little bit more clear. You know, I, I hate to keep repeating the same answer, but I mean, you know, once an operator becomes available and starts to build the customer base, you know, if that's a if that's a viable alternative for what the exchange does, then certainly we'll be you know open for their use and uh, they'll be able to use the facility. Another question. Yes, this lady right here. Are you expecting um, anybody that the um, kind of markets will have for the for the Portland um, harbor period, including the cold sword, will be from other states? And how far? I mean, is it going to be a hundred percent main use, or do you think that? You know, we're going to be, you know, attracting all people that have to going down to Wellster and Boston Harbors. I think I, I personally think that, you know, those shippers will definitely be attracted to the cold storage. And I mean, um, you know, I think there, there will be new customers, but there will also be existing customers that were doing something different that now have a new, you know, option to be able to choose from. And if the if the cost is right for them, then then, yeah, you know, they've. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really interesting too, because we, we, Matt and I kind of look at different, different numbers as, and I can, I can dig in with the data sources that I have. And I can tell you that, I mean, we've, we've had shipments going through the port of Portland that are coming as far as way as the Midwest. And I think even further West than that, I feel like California, it's a couple, yeah. couple points. If you're looking, especially for those markets in the North Atlantic, um, the Aimskip line is a compelling, is it makes a compelling cost to the point where you may, you know, actually think about shipping something from Illinois to to Maine to be put on a vessel and sent to Norway just because of the cost of the of the ocean shipment. Yeah. So yes, very much we're, we're thinking that way of of how do we market this as a regional asset, not just as a main one. Are are you seeing any of those folks trying to um um use use the notion that it's less environmentally damaging to ship something by water over the course of several days than by putting diesel trucks on a road or or jet fuel in the air yeah um i i know matt's got a couple of couple of things too but we've had some conversations with a um, salmon producer in the north atlantic that is actually moving their um, their fresh salmon by ocean freight um, because there is enough time to be able to transit it into Portland and by truck down to New York City, and it's cutting their carbon footprint by something on the order of like eighty five to ninety percent. And wow. that is something that they're using very much as a as a marketing um, tactic of you know we're not shipping this by air, which is the way that most of those types of products move. Um, and it is something that's unique to the fact that these markets are fairly closely linked and the transit time is just short enough that they can make it work. Hmm. Wow. Yes. Uh, Strawberry, you want to take one of the questions from our Zoom attendees? Sure. We've got a question from John. Do you expect the cold storage facility will increase demand for marine related business space on our working waterfront? Hmm. I think that's a pretty good question. I mean, um, 
Sure. I think, I think there's definitely a potential there. I mean, if, um, if the port itself grows because, you know, aim skips growing because there's other, you know, new business coming into terminals. I mean, just the, the, the overall growth of the port is naturally going to cause other support businesses and services to grow. So everything from, you know, ship chandlers to uh, bunkering services, agents, all of those different you know, pilots, all of those businesses that are connected just to the activity of the port will absolutely grow, um, you know, I guess proportional to the growth of the of the port facilities in the port. So, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I definitely think um, we could we could see, uh, you know, a, a, a boom of growth in the in the, in the port of Portland for sure. Any other questions from the audience here? Yes, this gentleman right here. I, I've got a question for Wade, I think, and that is when someone calls you up and wants to put something, thinking of shipping it to Europe, say, mm. do you think age skip or do you also think I just had a brief email exchange today with the North Atlantic cargo line, which mm. has got some space on the age skip mm. vessel? You say, well, we've got NAC, we've got a skipper. How, how do you divide up the interest if you do? Uh, that's a really good. That's a, a very good question, and and um, and you know, Matt and I had uh, Matt and I actually had this conversation earlier today about uh, about a completely separate issue that I won't bore you with. But it's um, there is the there's definitely the kind of push pull, right? So I'm I'm in the business of international trade development. I don't tell people what your options should or shouldn't be. If you want to try to move a box to Europe from a, now, this is keep in mind this is as the trade director. Um, I'm I'm line agnostic. If it makes sense for you to put it in a on Aimskip and get it over there, then great. And if it's going to make more sense for you to move it from New Jersey to because you're going to some place that Aimskip doesn't serve, then what we end up doing is we'll actually most likely refer to a um, a forwarder broker, a freight forwarder customs broker that will then help the person make the make the make the freight booking. Now, as the as one of the members of the board of directors of the main port authority, I'm also very interested in seeing throughput through the port. And so usually how we will handle it is here's a, here's a freight port you might want to talk to. And oh, by the way, if Aimskip is an option, um, let's put you in touch with them as well um, from the sales side. So we're really trying to make sure from the trade center's perspective that we're, we're balancing um, the what we would like to see in terms of growth at the at the marine terminal versus what the businesses actually need to be able to move the freight because sometimes you know like progressive insurance used to say right sometimes we're the best option and sometimes we're not and we're we're kind of in the business of making sure that the company's getting the right answer um, not necessarily the one that we would really like them to choose. <laughs> so. And I would I would just add to that um, I think that's an excellent question and um, <clears throat> you know Wade said he's you know, what did you say? But mode ag or not mode agnostic? Line, line agnostic. Yeah, line agnostic. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, main port agnostic. So you know, all of our ports do something you know a little different. And obviously, we specialize in handling you know containers at the International Marine Terminal. But if there's a you know bulk or break bulk project or some sort of project cargo, uh, where, you know they're bringing in a big component or something like that. Then we would probably, you know, direct that sort of project up to, you know, the Port of Sears Port. Um, they have a larger crane. They have more expertise in, you know, handling some of that stuff, um, you know, project cargoes and things like that. So, you know, while we own and operate the International Marine Terminal, that's not obviously the only the only operation in town, and uh, certainly not in the state. So we want to make sure that we get those businesses and those projects into the right facilities so they can do what they need to do efficiently and safely. What is break bulk? So break bulk would be uh, basically anything that's not really containerized. So, you know, palletized or sacked cargo, something like that. Um, you know, bailed cargo, those sorts of things that would be break bulk. Okay. Yeah. Well, I learned something new today. Wood chips, road salt, like wood chips, you know, that yeah. sort of thing. Are you using the conveyor belt up in Eastport yet? So I was actually uh, standing on the conveyor belt uh, just uh, this time last week, and um, <clears throat> it, it has not been used. Um, 
well, it, it's been used, but it hasn't been used recently. Um, you know, they're, um, they've, they've struggled a bit at the port through the, the pandemic and everything. So while things are picking up there um, and, and things are looking very promising for some new projects, yeah, they, they, it hadn't been used for a while, but that, that infrastructure exists and it, it works, works very well. And so. do you anticipate that it will be used for either wood chips or pellets or? Um, yes, I do at some point. Um, I think it has to be the right project, but absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And there's no more cattle going through Eastport, is there? There's no more cattle, uh, much to uh, the chagrin of the cowboys that were wrangling yeah. the steers that had escaped into town uh, multiple times. But uh, no, there, that, that, that project has not... Uh, pick back up since you know the last the last time they did it but mm. the containers and everything are still there it's pretty amazing mm. yeah interesting um and the up oh, yes this oh wait can i can i hold on one second because there was someone else who hasn't had a chance yet yes go right ahead v changes in the marketing of seafood that are uh, feeding into this need for cold storage for instance, I understand the market from frozen lobster is really increasing, and now that's much higher quality than it ever used to be. And um, as people demand more convenient food, they're more prepared seafood products mm. that used to be frozen. And when they have frozen product can take longer to get to a European market. Um, and still retain quality, where something that was just chilled, maybe the uh, three week period right that it takes to get from Portland to Europe, there could be some deterioration. Sure. But do you see changes in, in people's eating habits and in the technology of carrying food that is making cold storage even more important? Yeah, I was going to say, Pete, this is yeah, this, yeah. this is for you, man, because people weren't eating seaweed, Pete. Yeah, <laughs> you know? there is um, there is an increase in in customers wanting meals that they can buy frozen, ready to sort of ready to eat, ready to cook, and it's um, it's like they get to they get to cook in their cook in their kitchen, but have the convenience of something that's you know they don't have to chop all the vegetables and do all that type of thing. So um, there's definitely an increase in in that, and especially on the retail side. Um, I can't speak to the to the lobster industry and the and the freezing of lobsters, but um, there is for sure a, a change that, that definitely affected by the pandemic as well for people to be cooking at home, but sort of have the convenience of it already be prepared. I'm gonna I'm gonna go to this lady and then I'll come back to you. As I'm sure you're well aware, the cold storage facility has been um, somewhat controversial with local neighbors who were worried about the increased traffic, the blocking of their view to Casco Bay, which is why I assume the new facility has a lower um, ceiling height. Um, I just wondered if you could comment on the current state of affairs with local neighbors. Have you been able to reach a, a deal with them, or is that an ongoing issue? Yeah, no deal necessary. Um, you know, the project's been fully permitted through the city and and we've gone, you know, through all that process. So um, you know, I think uh really in the in the 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 recent announcement and uh you know the recent movement of the project, you know, we've reached out to the stakeholders, you know, down on the the West Commercial Street area, and uh they've been they've been supportive of what we're doing and um I think they like the project. So um I feel very confident that, you know, we've got, you know, a good, you know, bit of community behind us. And um, I have not really heard a lot otherwise, so. And I'm, I'm gonna let this fellow go and then I'll come take your question. Uh, given sea level change, mm -hmm. how much of the investment that's gone into the terminal has been to make that more resilient? Because when it was built 40 years ago, it had, the sea level changes no um, resiliency is always something that we're incorporating into, uh, you know, new projects or, or major rehabilitations and things like that. We we have not been um, doing work to the IMT facility or to the pier um, to take into 
to take much into account about sea level rise just because we we haven't really had to deal with that um you know right now like we haven't we haven't had to do any major work um you know to to rehabilitate the pier or anything like that when we would probably factor in you know sea level rise very heavily if we were going to do a redesign or something like that the last major bit of pier work that we did was an infill project where we didn't you know change the height of the pier or anything like what that is, what is the um like from mean lower low water i don't remember exactly what the height is i'm sorry yes go ahead i'm just wondering the work and all of these wonderful places and when it came to work front uh or its challenges as well as portland like housing challenges what kind of a risk does that present to the success of this you know major uh, yeah, I haven't, um, <clears throat> you know, I haven't really uh, gotten too involved in, you know, workforce development or things like that related just to the cold storage facility. But, um, you know, I can tell you that we have a robust workforce at the IMT. Um, and, and typically, you know, between the union employees that do the, the stevedoring and longshoremen operations, uh, the Port Authority actual staff, like the operations staff, which we contract for, uh, and then aim skips own, you know, liner division and their staff. Um, we've been looking to hire new individuals, um, you know, really for the, the last six months, it's, it's been, uh, something that we've been reacting to because of the growth. We actually are, are looking to hire two more individuals just strictly for security to accommodate for the, the extra vessel that's going to be coming to the terminal. So, um, you know, we're at least, I guess, you know, between the primary stakeholders, of the IMT very focused on growing the workforce. Um, as far as the cold storage, I mean, I think, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll be something that the operator will have to, you know, really think about and uh, make sure that, you know, they can hire the right people. But I don't think we're quite ready for that yet, or, you know, kind of thinking of, I think we're thinking about it, but I don't think, you know, we're not hiring anybody at this point. The Port of 30 certainly isn't for cold storage. So, um, you know, I think it'll it'll be interesting, you know. I think every business in Maine is grappling with that, those two problems right now. Yeah. If you guys had a, if you had some great solution, it, that would be great. <laughs> and it would be stolen and everyone would do what you were doing because it's such a pervasive problem. Well, and I know too the the design the 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 developer was definitely has been thinking about this because of the the presentations that we've seen um, are showing that there's going to be very heavy reliance on automation within the facility. So the the amount of workforce is probably going to be much less than what you were imagining for a hundred thousand square foot facility. A lot of automation that's going to need to go in there, um, okay. obviously. But you know, like you said, the workforce the workforce issue is something that is pervasive mm -hmm. throughout the whole state as is the housing issue. Um, and it's something that I don't, you know, I don't care what, um, I don't care what industry you're talking about. We're talking about cold storage. Now I'll take my trade center hat, put my economic development hat on um, and just say, you know, this is um, uh, something that's going to need to be solved. We're talking about a lot of big initiatives, whether it's food or, you know, defense supply chain or renewable energy or any of these other things. Um, where are we going to find the people to do it? And that's um, that's a it's a good question, and it's something that we really need to kind of keep our eyes on. And I wish I had a good answer, right? I mean, like you yeah. said, if I had if we had the right answer, we would be doing it. But yeah. um, but it's an important question, and it's it, it's one that definitely needs to be asked. Strawberry, let's take another Zoom question. Sure. Uh, when the Camden Conference discussed the Arctic in 2021, there was much speculation about the convenience of main ports to the opening of Arctic shipping lanes. Did we see any sign of that? Oh, Ross, we're going to toss that question to you. <laughs> no, I, I'm kidding. Maybe not. I don't know. Do, do you, do, would anyone on the panel like to, have we made any progress on those Arctic shipping lanes since last year's conference? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, well, it depends on what you're talking about as far as progress on Arctic shipping lines. But I mean, I think that, um, you know, obviously Matt throwing the, throwing the, the, 
the cargo, I mean, sorry, the container volume graph chart up there kind of speaks for itself that this was a, you know, that we've seen significant increase in trade um, across the North Atlantic. I, I threw out a number, I think it's about $100 million um, of exports from Maine, just of Maine. I know I've been talking in terms of region, but it's in terms of Maine products going to um, a North Atlantic market. It's and that's high. Probably um, the UK is included. I know the UK is included in that number and probably takes up about sixty-five percent of that. Um, the other markets are are also fairly small. Um, you know, so I think it's a it is a you know it's one of those it depends answers. But I think yes, growth and I think poised for future growth. I mean, I think the continues to be poised for future growth. I think this investment in cold storage infrastructure is an important piece of the puzzle. Um, we've been having a lot of conversations at MITC with um, our partners in Finland about the future of the forest products industry. There's a lot of uh, potential for trade there. I mean, we're still very much at the ideas and, and technology exchange um, piece of that. But, you know, Finland is about 20 years ahead of us in the redevelopment of their forest products industry. Um, there's some pretty exciting things that I think are, are cooking um, on the horizon for us. Um, so there's lots of there's lots of of what's happening and a lot of things that will be mm -hmm. um but that's the best part right mm -hmm. i mean we we're not trying to have an end to this this is sort of a continuing conversation um but one, not one that is like oh yeah it'll happen at some point but you know things are happening now and more things are coming mm -hmm. so. um any more questions here in the hall yes You're asking about if we need to make any accommodations or infrastructure changes to accommodate increased trucking that would serve the cold storage facility. Right. Yeah, I think that's true. And I also think that um, truck power is always something that we need at the at the terminal. And um, we had a real issue with that during the pandemic, where it was very hard to find drivers up until not really that long ago. Um, so as far as actual infrastructure, um, you know, I think we're we're fairly well set up in, you know, proximity to 295 and, and with highway access, I think um, we do have, you know, adequate space at the moment for truck queuing on Commercial Street. I think that it will be challenging when we have both facilities kind of running full tilt, but I think that we'll be able to accommodate it. So we're not necessarily planning any major infrastructure projects, just specific to trucking, but I'm thinking more about the availability of drivers and just truck power in general. I think that's something we always need to be cognizant of and make sure that we're able to move the containers out of the gate, you know? We have time for one more question. Oh, it can come from our Zoom folks. Uh, what will be the balance between import and exports in the use of the new facility? Uh, mm. Is that up to the operator? I, I'll, I'll, I'll bail Matt out on this one, I think. <laughs> Um, I, yes, it, yes, it'll be up to the operator. Thanks, we're done. Uh, <laughs> up to the operator. Um, I, I'm going to guess just because this is this this tends to be a an ongoing theme of the balance of trade um, in and out of Maine. Whether you're talking about the current thing, the the current import export balance, or um, the the number that I threw out, the two billion dollars of trade that's that's coming in, that's you know frozen food. Um, it generally is, it's fairly close to 50-50, but it skews more towards the import. So I, I have no reason to think that it's going to be anything other than that. Um, I would say it's about 60-40 skewed to the import side. Um, but again, we don't really know um, what this will do on the export side. I think obviously the uh, the upside is probably on the export side. Mm -hmm. But right now I'd say roughly 50-50 roughly where, where you want it to be. But I, I would say it's probably more like 60-40 right now. Okay. Thank you. 
This has been a terrific conversation. I want to thank USM. I want to thank the Camden Conference. I want to thank all of you folks for being here today. I want to thank our technical people who are handling all of our Zoom connections out there. And most especially, I want to thank our panelists because I think they were knowledgeable and articulate. And I learned a lot. Um, to, in fact, I got a lot of notes. And that means there could be a news story in the future here. Um, but if you would join me, please, in thanking everyone. You can put your uh, calendars uh, on notice for the next uh, Camden Conference event in February, where there'll be even a more expansive conversation about global trade. Um, and until then, I hope you all have a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you.